price the client, not the job. So if somebody says, what do you charge for X? You don't have an answer because the answer changes dramatically based on the client. Business of Architecture, episode 253. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears and I am your guide on this journey as you discover the tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and hyper-profitable architecture practice. If you haven't already, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Enter your best email address on that page and you'll get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. I absolutely love today's conversation and I think you will too. Today we speak with the author of two books, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto and his latest book, Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. He's one of the world's leading experts on pricing for creative professionals. His name is Blair Enns, and in our conversation today, you'll discover why you shouldn't send a written proposal and what to do instead, why you should always price the client and not the job, and six rules for pricing your services. There's also a couple of challenges we put out there in the podcast today. To respond to a challenge, you can reach me at enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. Blair Enns, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you, Enoch. It's my pleasure to be here. So you're an expert on pricing for creative professionals and a whole lot of other kind of business things that we may touch on in today's interview. Uh, but I wanted to structure this specifically around uh, this pricing strategy. And you sent me some, uh, is, this a, is this a pre-copy of your book, the one that's in the binder, or is this the final format of it? Nope, that's the book. It's been out since uh, the middle of January, 2018. Okay, yeah, that is fantastic. And... Highly recommend. Why does it, does it look unfinished? No, no, it looks very <laughs> polished and very finished. Um, but I have received manuscripts before that are in a binder form. Um, and I'm just yeah. curious, why did you choose the binder format instead of doing a traditional book? My first book, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto, um, is a traditional book. Uh, it's a bit short. It's 24,000 24, words. Gee, I hope I'm getting Yeah, it's 24,000 words. Um, and I consider that to be the yes, you can book. You can read it in a couple of hours. And at the end of it, you're, you're, um, I imagine that the reader is kind of inspired that there's this new way of going about getting new business. So in, in the creative professions, most of the creative professions that I serve, we use new business as code for, for selling. Um, and then when I wrote this book, uh, Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour, I really wanted to write a here's how to book. And so I, I, as I was writing it, I imagined it as a manual. I wanted, um, even though it's available in three different formats, I really wrote it as a manual. So it's, it's, I believe it's readable enough to read most of it, um, is, uh, for, I think it's kind of easily readable and, and, uh, hopefully somewhat enjoyable, but I imagined that after the reader, read it for the first time, they would put it on a shelf not too far from their desk. And then the next time they had to um, package up and price a proposal, they would pull the manual off their shelf, flip to the relevant sections, and then go to the, to remind themselves of some of the key principles, and then go to the last section, the last tab of the book, which is the tool section, where I have checklists and templates and things to use to help people actually craft a proposal. Yeah, and I've been a study of business for a while. This is a in-depth and very well put together tome. So hopefully, uh, I would definitely recommend any of our architecture firms take a look at this. Uh, I'm curious, have you worked with any architecture firms? A small number. Usually the architecture firms that we work with are kind of just periphery to, so sometimes they're just interiors. Um, we, there's in the, it's not so much graphic design anymore, but in the greater design world, there's, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you might have kind of pure architecture and like a design build. And then you go out towards like interiors, architecture, interior designer, and then other things. So on that spectrum, more towards the, um, designer, um, uh, but yeah, we, so we have some interiors firms in our training program right now. We've had landscape design 
companies. We've had interior design companies through our training program. But, you know, we, it's interesting. I'm really curious about this podcast and, and how it goes over with your audience because we attract a lot of interest from architects. And a fair number of architects have bought the book already. Um, and we have conversations with them about helping them on the training front, but very few of them are, are, are most of them are reluctant to pull the trigger on some sort of training when it comes to selling or pricing their services. So maybe by the end of this podcast, you'll tell me why that is. Uh, I was going to ask you the same question, <laughs> Blair. I was going to say, why do you think that is? I think, uh, I honestly think that uh, architects, and this is a generalization, so I'll take all the lumps that comes with making general generalizations. But I think generally speaking, architects find it difficult to admit that they there are parts of the, maybe not the craft itself, but the business around the craft where they are lacking. What do you think of that hypothesis? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're getting pretty you're, deep here pretty quick, but, um, yeah. you know, you're less willing to alienate your audience than I am, I guess. Oh no, trust me. They'll <laughs> tell you I'm perfectly willing to alienate them. Um, it's a good question and it is, a, I think it's an important question, especially for this conversation. And what I'd say to our listener is as you have, uh, as you hear Blaise Blair say that, what are your thoughts as the listener? Yeah, I would love some feedback on on my hypothesis. And as you're listening right now, I would I would invite our listener to make do a self analysis, just to try to think: Is that true about me? Um, are there maybe some areas where I'm refusing to learn or try some new strategies because I feel that that would reduce somehow my competence as a professional? I don't know, Blair. So we sell we have a marketing and training course as well that we um, coach architects on. And so I, I'm laughing because I'm very familiar with this and I'm not super surprised to find the architects be hesitant. I, I think from my experience, one, um, one of the things that I would throw out there in terms of that would be that um, I find architects have difficulty. It's an insular profession. Mm -hmm. We learn from our mentors. Um, it's a lot of times difficult for us to take something that other inter industries are doing and try to apply to what we're doing. We have a difficulty... I'm speaking for myself, but there's prior architects that say, yeah, Enix, right, in terms of really applying some of these strategies and just wondering, well, how would that really work for an architect? You know, when really, I think that we're all, we're all really the same. I mean, if you look at how, you know, web, web designers, um, creative professionals price their services, I'm getting a lot of value out of this here. Um, but I just think that we just do things the way they've always been done, Blair, and that it's a risk to go out there and try something different. Yeah, I and I don't think architects are alone in that front. I think you're right. It, architecture is more insular than the other, what I would call the creative professions, because in those other creative professions, I think architects would, would be dismiss, dismissive of the label of professions because there isn't the barrier to entry that there is in architecture. Therefore, anybody can be a graphic designer um, or, or claim to be. Um, so I think there is, for those reasons, you know, for some fairly good reasons, architecture tends to look inward. But, you know, a lot of my clients are in the innovation business. A lot of uh, creative firms have gone from selling ideas and advice to actually working to help companies innovate their product services business model. So there's a natural evolution there. And innovation always comes from the outside. So uh, I think any insular profession if you find the most, the most innovative ones are taking cues from outside of the profession. Like Win Without Pitching, my business is a sales training organization and I own all the books on selling and I've never read any of them. I've skimmed through most of them, some of them, but I, there's just something about selling, which I think, I think, um, you know, that dirty S word, I don't see sales as, as a, as a dirty job. I think when it's done wrong, when the incentives aren't properly aligned to the goals, when the person isn't appropriately trained, when they're, when they're told that selling is the act of talking people into things, then that's when selling becomes this dirty thing. And there's something about, there's something, something about most of the standard guidance on selling that I just work to avoid. 
Um, so, because I think there are other, I, I'm always looking for models outside of what I do, finding a model in, in, in various branches of sciences to see if I can bring it back. So I'm always looking for other models that translate into selling so that I can think about selling differently than everybody else thinks about it. Um, I'll give you two examples. I think sell, I think buying is changing. Therefore selling is change management. So if you want to become a better salesperson, study any decent change management model. And there are lots of them. I also think selling professional services or any kind of sophisticated or expensive service is, uh, is a good parallel as leadership. I think you can read any book on leadership and you can directly translate leadership to selling. So I'm always looking for models out there. And what I would suggest to architects, maybe who, who are not used to looking outside of their profession, I would say for all, for, for business advice, I would say, I think, um, you can, you can get closer to the best practices and the benchmarks of your profession if you study those that have come before you. But if you want to transcend that, if you want to transcend your business model, if you feel restricted by convention, if, you've, if, um, if you want to go way beyond what others have done before, you're not going to get there by studying those that have gone before you. You're going to get there by studying those outside of your profession. Well, I have to say that the listeners on my show, Blair, are they are the 5%. So I'm sure they, they are the ones that um, are looking to other industries and can see how a lot of these strategies may, not, may or may not apply to what they're doing. So you have a very good audience today. You said something here in the preface to the, uh, the book that I just want to read out here. And I want to get your ideas on this, what you meant by this. You said, let's just say we all understand time and money until we're asked to explain them. And then you continue to say, I've concluded that I neither... Uh, that I understand neither, and I have yet to encounter someone who understands both. Yeah, every time I do an interview, I always have to tell myself, Blair, don't start talking about the physics of time. <laughs> <laughs> and here you go and pick out the one thing in the book that I really want to talk about and remind myself not to talk about. It's a rabbit hole. It's, you know, there's so many things, words, phrases that we all think we understand until we're asked. And another one of them is strategy. So when I hear somebody say, oh yeah, that other firm is pretty good, my competitor, but they don't, they don't do strategy. I ask the question, what is strategy? And you think you know what strategy is until I ask you what the question is. And when, until I ask you directly, then you think about it, you go searching for a definition. Um, and I'm, one of my hobbies is collecting answers to that question. It's amazing how few people have thought of that question or thought deeply about it. It's amazing how few people have formulated a, a definition or even, even thought about what it means and, and therefore what a proper strategy is. Uh, time and money are also two of those things. And I kind of went a little crazy trying to unpack that phrase, time is money. I knew, I knew that um, you know a big part of the book, it's on value-based pricing. So it's about moving away from selling time to selling outcomes, not, not the inputs of time and materials, not the outputs of the deliverable, but the value, the outcome, the value that you will create for the client. So I knew that, you know, time wasn't money necessarily, but maybe it is at some times, but I, when I start, so I own four books on the physics of time. Um, and it's become kind of a personal, uh, journey of mine. And all, so now I, I've come to conclusions, like I'm not even sure the past is real. Time is a, there are different ways to think about time, but most of the ways that we refer to time, it's a human construct. It's not a, it's not kind of a fundamental principle of the universe. It doesn't exist out there. It's something we invented. Um, it's not a resource to be mined. And that's the way most of us in the professions, we look at time as a resource. You, I think you go from seeing time as a resource in your evolution of your understanding of time and how to, how to, um, leverage time in your business. You go first from seeing it as a resource to be mined and sold. Then you start to see it as a constraint. And then you get untangled from it completely. And you get to this place where 
it's not like you ignore it completely, but you see everybody else tethered to time and encumbered by that tether while you kind of float free above them. So does that answer your question I, of what, what time is? I don't know what time is. I was even this morning, I just came back from a business trip and I was in the airport this morning, once again, thinking about a proper definition of money. And I thought maybe money is a storage of knowledge, is knowledge stored as freedom. Knowledge translated into a store of freedom. But even that has got all kinds of things wrong with it. There, you went and did it. Now we're talking about these <laughs> weird topics. Well, that's great. I'm sure my listeners right now are thinking, this is a great episode. This is a little, this is, uh, this is, this is authentic. <laughs> Take a hit from the bong and let's keep talking about this <laughs> crazy stuff. That's right. Well, and I'm just curious um, in terms of time, you know, how would you describe to me what it means to be liberated from time, to be floating as everyone else is chained to it? What does that mean for you? So there's a story in the book of a friend of mine who um, he, he's an cons independent consultant, solo consultant, and he had a client, and his client introduced him to a friend who had a business challenge, and he said, my friend will help you out. So um, this guy emailed my friend his challenge, and my friend crafted a very novel solution in the reply, and he was about to send it back to him. And the last line of the email, he told me this in a story not too long after it happened. The last line of the email was, good luck with this, let me know how it works out. And he said, at the last minute, I changed the last line to my fee for this idea and helping you implement it is $600,000. And the, um, the guy said yes right away. And then uh, so I, I told, I wrote my friend's story in the book without naming him. And I didn't, I hadn't talked to him in a little while. So I, I didn't, I knew, I knew the engagement was going well. Um, but I didn't check in with him. I didn't ask him permission to use his story. I changed the name, um, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't call him to validate, you know, kind of the state of how how things had played out in the end. I thought, you know, the story is good enough. And then um, a, a month or so after the book is out, I'm getting on a plane in Australia on a speaking tour, and I get an email from him saying, "Hey, I just read the book, and I, f I forgot about telling you that story, and I just reminded of how much my life has changed in that moment." And he told me in a very lengthy email that I sat reading there on the tarmac, he told me all of these stories of the engagement. So that engagement ended up being into the seven figures, his compensation. And he, he said, I'm, I'm no longer a consultant that sells capacity. I'm an entrepreneur. And when somebody comes to me as a consultant with a business challenge, I look at how I can create the most value. So he listed a bunch of engagements where his compensation is six, seven, and eight figures. He is not selling hours. He's not selling days. What he's selling is, has nothing to do with time. Now, granted, he's got to do some rough math on the restrictions of time, of how much time he can spend on things. But he's not being valued based on how much time. He's being valued based on the outcomes he's helping to deliver for his clients. That's what I mean by being disentangled or un, from or unrestricted by time. Awesome. And of course, your subtitle of this book is A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. So let's jump into that. Uh, obviously, architects, like a lot of other uh, you know, professional service providers, it's all about the billable hour. Yeah. Blair, so let's, let's dive into this. Um, I want to start here with uh, something I found here in the very first chapter where you said that what you found is that the profit of the firm and the lifetime compensation of the principal have very little to do with what some might see as the quality of the creative or the quality of the product and even less to do with the time logged by the owner. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's funny, you know, people in the creative professions, I think especially your principals of creative firms in the first few years of their business, and maybe, maybe it carries on for a while, they'll, they make a rough correlation between um, income and quality of the creative product. 
And I think architects would agree or would, would disagree with the statement. It's another general statement. And they'll, they'll be wrong, but they'll disagree with it. And that's that, um, and it's just another way of saying what you just read. And that's that for the most part, there are times when you care a whole hell of a lot more about the little details of what, of, of the design that the client doesn't care about. I see it routinely across all the creative professions. So I'm assuming it happens in architecture and I'll be shocked. I have friends who are architects. So I'll be shocked if it's, this isn't true. This, this over delivery, this over designing of the project, because you are holding yourself to a standard, even though the client hasn't paid you for that standard. One of the principles in the books, one of one of the six uh, in the book, one of the six rules, is the idea that you should always offer options in your proposals. Um, and so those options, uh, there are different ways to kind of put those options together. But if somebody says they have a budget of one hundred thousand dollars, then you owe it to them to put forward the one hundred thousand dollar option. But if you think it would take two hundred thousand to do this properly. You're, you're free to put forward a $200,000 option as well, and maybe even a 300000 or four hundred, whatever you want. The mistake is to try to deliver the, to think, okay, when, when I design a project, it, it, it has all of these things or meets all of these standards, when not every client values all of those things. So all creative professionals need to learn to deliver an option a cheaper priced option that strips out some of the things that they would really want to do, but things that that client probably doesn't value. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does to me. I mean, I know that uh, I've taught a couple presentations on pricing and there is sometimes there is pushback from, you know, architects feeling like, you know, we're, we're held to a professional standard of X, right? And, um, but I think that, a, I mean, my personal opinion, Blair, is that a lot of time I think that that personal, that, that standard to which we're held, we, as you say, we over deliver on that. And a lot of times our clients, they're not even the wiser for all the extra time and effort and detailing that we put into the project. Yeah. So there's, let's talk about your rules. You mentioned that, and I'm just going to run through them right here. Price the client, not the job. Offer options. Anchor high, say a price before you show a price, master the value conversation, and un and limit unpaid proposals to one page. Can we start in reverse order and tell me about limiting the unpaid proposals to one page? Yeah, it's a bit tricky to work backwards um, because the rules kind of build on each other. But it's uh, I for years I as a sales consultant and a sales trainer I operated under the motto of the proposal is the words that come out of your mouth. The document is the contract. And the first time I heard that, I thought it was heresy. I thought, this, what do you mean? The pr proposals where I came from growing up in ad agencies, growing up professionally in ad agencies and some design firms, the proposal was a 50 to 100 page document that kind of sketched out the out background of the situation as we understood it. Um, our uh so our, our diagnosis of the situation if i use the medical terms our prescription of a strategy um all kinds of background about us and sa sales information about the about the firm and about the individuals who would be involved in the project um some free creative ideas and then in the very last page we would put the price in a place to sign and somebody came along once and said you know these are absolutely ridiculous you're conflating the idea of a proposal with a contract and neither the proposal nor the contract should have should have sales information information where you are trying to persuade what you're doing is you're you're asking the document to do something that you yourself should be doing so i when i was taught that i immediately made a shift and got out of the written proposal business and then it's been you know 20 over 20 years since i've written a proposal and I've helped many of my clients get out of the proposal writing business. So we, you would, um, I would have my clients just facilitate a direct, not go into a presentation mode, have a conversation instead of a presentation, uncover what it is the client wants, and then craft kind of an oral agreement saying, well, okay, well, here's what we do. And maybe reference 
while referencing work that you've done previously. So saying it might be a bit like this, look like this, it'll take this long. The price is going to be this much money. And once you have an agreement in principle, then you would write up the contract. So the proposal is the words that come out of your mouth. You get the verbal okay. And again, you might be leaning, leaning on some tools, like some case studies as references. And then once you get the okay, you craft the proposal. So I held firm with that approach until I went, until I um, discovered the world of value-based pricing. And the way value-based pricing should work is one of the rules is to always offer options. We'll talk about why that's important. And so when you're putting forward options, you do need some sort of reference material. You do need a piece of paper to reference those to, to be to communicate to the client what's available in the different options. Now, what you don't need is you don't need reams of paper. You can get it all down onto one page. So that's the idea is the proposal is here's my proposal. It's an oral proposal. And you slide forward a piece of paper with your various options on that one page to facilitate. And then you facilitate the discussion around that piece of paper. And then once the client chooses an option, you have an agreement in principle, then you write up the contract. And if, if any of your listeners have already been through this transition, they're smiling to themselves, but I'll bet most of your listeners are thinking, Oh yeah, nice theory, nice theory, Blair, but this is never going to work in our world. And then you will hear, mark my words, Enoch, you will hear from one of your listeners who tries this and who comes back to you and says, oh my God, I cannot believe all of the hours and maybe even days and weeks of my life I have wasted putting together lengthy, unnecessary written proposals. I guarantee you that is going to happen. I wish I could say every, every listener will experience this. Most of them won't. Most of them are just so opposed to the idea that this is even possible. They think, nice theory, but it's not applicable in my business. It, they're wrong. It's applicable in their business. Um, let's see. I would just challenge everybody to muster the courage to try it once. Let's do it. I want to hear the first person that tries this. And hey, if it's successful, let me know. If it's also successful, let us know. We want to be, Who's going to be the first person to get back to us? All right, Blair, let's, so let's take it from the top then. We'll jump back up to your rules here. Take us through the rules and just give us a sort background on what they mean to us. Yeah, rule number one is price the client, not the job. So what that means is if, if a client or a prospective client comes to you and says, what do you charge for X? You don't have an answer. Because if you have an answer, even if you have a narrow range, well, we typically charge between X and Y. That means you are selling based on the inputs of time material, you're pricing based on the inputs of time and materials, or you're pricing based on this like market value in air quotes of the deliverables of the outputs. So there are three things you can sell inputs, outputs, and outcomes, or otherwise stated as value. And with the goal of this book is to get to people to start to price based on the value that they communicate to the client. So if you're pricing based on value, then before you can set a price, you have to have a conversation with the client about and un unearth what the value of this engagement would be to the client. And there's a methodology for that. And that's rule number five. We can talk about that, but that's number one, price the client, not the job. So if somebody says, what do you charge for X? You don't have an answer because the answer changes dramatically based on the client. Um, rule number two is to always offer options. We talked a little bit about that, but uh, the importance of options. Most people put forward a proposal with one option. It's essentially a take it or leave it proposal. And then you can watch the client try to figure out, well, is this the proposal is for, you know, let's say it's a certain percentage of the build or, or and let's just translate that to a number. And let's say that number is $100,000. Um, then they have to do the math. Like is they, they actually have to, the brain has to work away and, and ask, answer the question, is, is this proposal worth this much money? But the human brain is not actually wired to answer that question. And I prove this in the book with a couple of visual images is not wired to answer that question. Is this proposal worth $100,000? All they can do is say, is this, sorry, they can do, they can answer the question, which of these is the best value? So that's the question that you want to enable the client to answer, which of these is the best value? Human beings cannot subjectively perceive absolute value. So if your client looks at the proposal, they have to go get something to compare it against. So they go get bids from other architects, 
or there are other things that could compare against. So the goal here is to control the comparisons by putting options in front of the client. And there's all kinds of stuff in the book about how you might break those options down and different ways to slice and dice them. Um, rule number three is to anchor high. And what that means is you, when you deliver your proposal, you begin with the highest priced option first. And the, the goal of that, the price on the most expensive option is not to sell that option. It's the goal of that option is to make the other options look less expensive. And there's no bell prize winning science behind this. Um, so you anchor high, you begin with this high number and we won't get into how it works, but you begin with this high number and then you move to either the least expensive option or the one in the middle, or you might have four options. I like to talk about three, three is better than two, four is good as well. You could do five. I think that's getting a little, little, little bit elaborate. So you begin with the high anchor and you can read about the science of anchoring. Daniel Kahneman's book, thinking fast, thinking slow talks about it. Um, quite extensively. He's the, he, he and his research partner, Amos Tversky, are the ones who pioneered the science in that area. Rule number um, one, two, three, four is say a price before you show a price. So that comes not from the world of pricing or behavioral economics, but from the world of sales. And that's if there's a price objection, you want to hear it beforehand. So before you retreat to put together your options, you, you have what's known as the value conversation, which we'll talk about next with the client. You uncover the value you might create. Then you set a price range and then you retreat to think about, okay, what options could you put forward in that price range? So putting that price range forward begin, before you begin to do your proposal is important because it takes away any shock. And if there's a price objection, you get to hear it. Rule number five is to master the value conversation. So we talked about rule number six, limit unpaid proposals to one page. Rule number five is the only one, it's basically an issue of tacit knowledge. What I'm saying to you is I, com I communicate in the book what a value conversation is and what framework you would use to have a value conversation. So that's where you endeavor to uncover how much value you might create for the client and then what your fair share of that value in the form of comp compensation might be. It's called master the value conversation because I tell you how to do it but that's not good enough. Um, and this ability to master the value conversation is what sets apart those high, super high income earners. Um, my friend that I talked about earlier, he's learned to master the value conversation. So I see three levels of financial success. I've seen the efficient firms that bill is, is many, their, their billable efficiency is very high. Their utilization rate is high. They bill as many hours as possible or as close to as many as possible. The second level of success is those who let go of time and, or at least start to dabble with value-based pricing. They'll start to increase their prices in certain situations because they'll price the client, not the job. And they'll realize this is worth more to this client. So they'll increase their price based on that. And their, their profit will go up substantially just based on that. But the third level is those who master the value conversation. They move from thinking of themselves as, as in my friend's case, a consultant, in your client listener's case, an architect, they, they actually transcend the bounds of their own business model and they start to see themselves as entrepreneurs. And yes, they still do architecture, but architecture is just the main tool that they use to help create value for their clients. And they start finding other ways to help create value. And they start charging fees and commanding compensation that just puts like hourly, there's just no way you could compute these into hourly, into hourly rates. That is the highest level. That's when you actually move from a professional to an entrepreneur. So it's also the hardest to do and it's hardest to do because um, it's a sales skill. It's a human, it's a facilitation of human interaction and human change. And it, you need to fail forward. And most people give up after the first awkward value conversation. So those are the six rules of pricing creativity. Awesome. When you define entrepreneur for me in your definition, Blair. Yeah. So an entrepreneur, so I'll give you my definition of marketer. I've heard lots of definitions for it. And then I'll explain what I see as an entrepreneur. A marketer is somebody who looks at the market, identifies something that is missing or poorly met, and then they match a product or a service to that need, to that unmet need at a profit. An entrepreneur is essentially a marketer with skin in the game, is somebody who takes risk 
puts their financial situation on the line to match a product or a service to a need at a profit. So there's this, I think there's two, there's two hallmarks of an entrepreneur. One is they're driven by freedom, the freedom away from things and the, the freedom from things and freedom to things as Dan Sullivan, founder of strategic coach would say, that's his thing. And the second thing is uh, hype um, is a, uh, is there are risk takers. There are, there are no, or there are very few entrepreneurs who are, who uh, abhor risk. And as Peter Drucker, the management consultant, essentially the father of management consulting said in profit in business, all profit comes from risk. Entrepreneurs take a lot of risk. And in, when you start value-based pricing, when your fees start going up, generally speaking, this, will, this generally holds true, the higher your price relative to what your competitors might charge or you know, essentially your higher, higher your margins, the higher your price, um, the more risk or uncertainty you are taking away from the client. Your low-priced options are, are those options that see the client taking most of the risk. If you sell time and materials, you're pushing all of the risk to the client. If you're delivering price certainty, if you're selling deliverables at a set price, then you're taking some of that risk and the client is paying a premium or should be paying a premium for price certainty. And then when you're selling value at the very extreme end of the equation, you could actually take all of the risk. You could say to the client, you, you don't pay us until or unless certain metrics are met. So some litigators, some lawyers get paid on this basis, contingency payment. Now, I, I don't think it makes sense to structure your entire business around that. And I'm not sure what the equivalent would be in the architecture world. I'm just pointing out that there are so many different ways to price. And how you price, how you choose to price is a function of your own personal risk profile it's also a function of the assessment that you are making of your client's propensity for risk. And uh, once you explore this topic a little more, as I do in the book, I think most people come to the realization that they price based on their, their they assume their risk level, their client's risk level is theirs. And they're almost always wrong. Can you, can you illustrate that with an example, Blair, what you mean by that? Um, great example. I live in a small town in British Columbia in the middle of nowhere. And I had, um, he's retired now, but I had this mechanic who I would bring my car in for work. And uh, I'd say, I, I want to replace the brake pads. I think this, they're getting a little bit low. And I would come back and he would say, hey, great news. You've got a little bit of life left on those brake pads. So I didn't change them for you. And what he was doing is he was a very kind of parsimonious person. He was, he, he valued saving money and I didn't care about the money. I had four small kids and I was <clears throat> driving mountain roads, Canadian mountain roads in the winter. And I wanted to pay, I was willing to pay the premium to make my risk level go down. And he thought, well, I would never do that. I would get a few more miles out of these brake pads. So he was imposing his risk level on me. Perfect. That's, that's an awesome example. So Blair, going to the, um, the last rule, which we touched on at the beginning here. Um, you know, I know a lot of people have heard this, that, that you say here, just send over the proposal and I'll get back to you. Classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been great talking everything sounds great. Can you just put that in writing, send it on over and we'll have a look at it and we'll get back to you guys. Right. And you give the analogy of treating a proposal as little children. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah. You wouldn't send your little children out in, out into the world to, to spend time with strangers without you present. Right. So don't do the same to your proposal proposals. I I'm fond of saying a great line is I, I'm not really in the proposal writing business. So um, I'm, I'm happy to put something together for you. And in exchange, we're going to either sit down face to face or over a web meeting, and then I'll review it with you. So that that's a trade you're making. I will generate a proposal for you. And again, the proposal is really the words that are going to come out of your mouth, but you've got this one page document to facilitate that conversation. So I will generate a proposal for you in exchange. We're going to sit down when I have it, we're going to sit down and talk 
and I'm going, you're going to let me talk you through it. And you can even say, listen, it's not a 50 page proposal. It's going to be a one page proposal. I'm going to reference some things. So you get a, a sense of context. Um, and it doesn't kind of stand alone on its own without a conversation. So, um, I'll put it together. Let's set a time and a date for the conversation. And then when we both get on the call or in the room, I'll share it with you at that time. And you do not have to apologize for this approach. You're not in the business of being the third bid for others. There's no requirement for you to go to work and produce something for a client only that they can have it sit and rot in their inbox or do you know or shop it around. It's not like it's not your job to enable that. So I'm just I just say to the listener, um, just have a little bit of backbone on this issue. You there's no requirement for you to do any of these things, and you're not being rude. Um, if you, as long as you have a smile on your face when you're saying it, um, you're not being rude. You're just standing up for sound business practices. When do you recommend people get to the pricing conversation? Yeah. So there's generally speaking, you want to talk money early and often, but in broad ranges. So you might say, you know, where our projects tend to range from, uh, and then a big, like a, a, start with a big number, like the, drop the biggest number you've ever worked on, um, this project on the high end, and then paint. It's important that you kind of define the range by saying, on the low end, it doesn't make sense for us to get involved in a project underneath this size. So that's what I would call your minimum level of engagement. So you can talk money early, early on by actually putting your minimum level of engagement out there, or you can talk in really super broad ranges. Again, there's if you don't have really broad ranges, that gets a little bit different. But if you if you're in a conversation with a client that you think is price sensitive, it's in your interest to have them jump over a financial hurdle early on. So you might say you might use your minimum level of, of engagement, which in most firms, the, the starting point for the math of your MLO, as I call it, is about 10% of your fee income target for the year. So if you're going to bill a um, million dollars or 10, let's say a million dollars this year, then your minimum level of engagement should be somewhere around $100,000. And I won't get into the math on, on why that is. So you might say, you know, before we go too far, it seems like a bit of a small project. You need to know we have a minimum level of engagement of around 100000 in fees. And then you just stop and say nothing after that, because whatever you hear in the silence is going to be really valuable information. So you could do that. And so, yeah, if you could, if, and if you, one of the win without pitching tenets is say what you're thinking. So if you've got a small client and you think the project is small, say it, say it early. You might say, you know, before we go too far, um, I have to say, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit worried about the fit here financially. We, we have a minimum lo level engage, engagement of X. I just want to make sure that you're you're comfortable in a level higher than that. Um, I would only do that with uh, small clients where you where you you were just worried about whether or not this is worth your time. If you're if you're worried about whether or not this is worth your time, then say it. Now, a larger client with a bigger project where the opportunity seems like you can add some incredible value here. Generally speaking, and where when you're dealing with senior decision makers, generally speaking. The later you get to price, the higher it is likely to be. So it's a little bit, there's, there's a little bit of mixed messages here, I know. But if you're concerned about price and the size and the clients, whether they're price sensitive, address it early. If it looks like a big high value project and you're dealing with senior people who have the ability, you, when you're dealing with executives, they are the ones in the organization who are charged um, with future value. And so I know some of your clients would do, maybe a lot of them do residential work. Um, the homeowner is the decision maker. So if you think this is a rich person, we're talking about a big project, you don't have to talk money er er early. If you think this person is price sensitive, it's in your interest to talk price money early before you end up wasting your time. Blair, when we look at the book, what are the, some things that didn't make it into the book? more on the physics of time. <laughs> um, one of the things that I didn't put in the book that will definitely be in the next edition is, and that's probably 18 months away, 
is guidance on what should be in the proposal. And I have to, I'm not a lawyer. I have to be careful. Sorry, what should be in the contract? How to frame a contract for value-based fees. But Alan Weiss in his book, I think it's called Value-Based Fees. He does a pretty good job of that. So I would say if you're looking for some guidance, if you are pricing based on value, um, he's got some pretty good examples of some language. And I'm seeing some of my clients use it now. Um, and I'm pretty impressed with it. So yeah, some guidance on proposals. And um, some other stuff that isn't relative to architecture, I think there's in the um, digital design business and in particular software engineering, there's a project management method known as Agile. And um, there's a big argument. It's an Agile is kind of, I think it's a wonderful way of working. Um, but most people who embrace Agile are adamant that you cannot price based on value in, <clears throat> in an Agile um in an agile firm. That's wrong. So I'm going to, I talked about it briefly in the book. I'm going to show in more detail in the ne next edition why that is. Debunk that myth. Mm -hmm. Blair, how do people find out more about what we've been talking about today? Yeah, thanks. They can go to pricingcreativity.com. So it's the only place where you can get this book. Um, it's the first pricing book in the world, I believe, that's priced based on the principles in the book. So there are three options. Um, there's a $320 option where you can get the book in three different formats. There's a $200 or $199 option and a $100 option. And it's uh, all versions of the book are fully guaranteed. So if anybody buys it and doesn't make more money or doesn't, for whatever reason, wants to return it, we refund your money, no questions asked. We sold over a thousand copies. Nobody's returned it yet. Um, and uh, I think if people do buy the book, what I would like them to do is after they've read the book and they started applying the principles, I would love them to go back to that website, pricingcreativity.com and look at the pricing principles that we are employing on that page um, and see how many they can identify. There you go. There's a challenge just rife with challenges in this interview <laughs> yeah yeah send it in let's let's put a test out there to our listeners who can be the first one to uh write in with all of the pricing strategies and what we'll do is uh if you send that in and i can forward that to blair maybe blair will give me the answer or he can look at it but i will personally sponsor you uh the hundred dollar level of that book we'll send you one sounds good Gratis Fantastic. from me yeah okay Blair, thanks for being on the Business of Architecture with us today. Thanks, Enoch. It was my pleasure. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for my next upcoming online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. To discover how to market your firm to win the kind of projects and clients that you want to be working with and on, sign up for my next free design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances, both in the office and on the go with a beautiful and easy to use mobile app. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.